Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. <coughs> okay, so then there are um, two online homeworks, that is to say WebAssign, they're open. Um, there's two, uh, so any questions about getting into WebAssign? Getting that figured out. Okay, there's two written homeworks, that is to say you've got to, you've got to go to a different place and log in and download two different PDFs, and those PDFs have barcodes on the top. Any question about finding those? Yes? Do we have to turn in that first one, the zero, zero one? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, for, it's for a grade. Oh, all right. And then I put a little coffee stain joke on it. Haha. -ha. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm also thinking about using it and password, but it wouldn't let me log in for some reason. Okay. So take me back to the same page that said you need to authenticate. Okay. So, so were you copying the password from the gradebook? I tried copying it and pasting it. I also tried typing it. Okay. Send me an email, and I'll double check it. Okay. So if you if you registered like after, so I set it up once, and if you happen to register after that, then it's not set up yet, and I need to redo it. So okay. that that may be the case. Okay. Thank you. But but please send me an email. So other questions. So there's also a quiz that's available for you to register. It's not available for you to do yet, but it's available for you to register. So you can log on to the testing center registration site and reserve a time for a seat. So, so the way that works is you log on, it's a pretty straightforward process, and you say, I'm so-and-so and I want to register for a seat at this time. So, so you get that registered, then you go to the testing center with your photo ID and say, I'm so-and-so and here's my photo, photo ID and I'm here to take a quiz. Okay, quiz zero is for a grade, but it's, there's no math exercises on it. Okay? It's, it's more or less a demonstration of how you get how you register for the testing center, uh, then how do you make it to the testing center with your photo ID, and if you can carry that out and bubble in your net ID, then you'll get full credit on that quiz. Okay, there's no math. Shouldn't, shouldn't be a big problem, but it is for a grade. So any questions about the quiz zero? Okay, so any questions about anything before we continue? Okay, so last time we were talking about whether or not the square root of 2 is rational. Whether or not the square root of 2 is rational. So let's continue that discussion. So this is a continuation from last time. So just to remind you of the, of the important bits, we said, okay, we're going to assume that the square root of 2 is in the quotients. And specifically, we're going to assume the following things. We're going to say that, OK, well, if that's the case, then the square root of 2 is p over q with p is positive and q is positive. And they're both integers. and two, that p over q is simplified. Simplified. So what does that mean, simplified? What does that mean when you have a fraction? You can't divide the top by the bottom. Right. So an example of something that is simplified is something like 3 over 10. 3 over 10 is simplified. An example of something that is not simplified is 75 over 100. 75 over 100 is not simplified because you could factor out 25 in the numerator and the denominator and get 3 fourths. 3 fourths is simplified because 3 and 4 share no common factors. Okay. Then here's the bit that I'll omit that we did last time, so you can just look in your notes or whatever. We came to the following conclusion. We said, therefore, it must be the case that 2q squared is p squared. 2q squared is p squared. 
And that tells us because p squared is 2 multiplied by something, it must be the case that p squared is even. Because it's 2 times something. So for example, 102 is even because it's 2 times 51. It's 2 times something. OK. But now let's consider. Uh, what if p, consider the case when p itself is even. How about if p is 10? Well, what's p squared? 100, right? which is also even. Okay. What if p is odd, like 7? Well, what's 7 squared? <laughs> Getting met with silence. Is that because this is confusing or because this is boring? 49. Okay. <laughs> it's 49, which is also <laughs> odd. So do you, do you observe that if you square something even, it's still even? Yes. And if you square something odd, it's still odd. Okay. So as a result of this, it must be the case that P itself is even. Now, we're going to talk about even and oddness in this class a lot. So in order to make that discussion a little more fluid, I'm going to introduce a vocabulary word. And the vocabulary word is parity. P-A-R-I-T-Y. Parity. And this means even or oddness. So the way that this could be used in a sentence is something like this. Please tell me, what is the parity of 14. It's even. even. So the parity of 14 is even. And also, how about the parity of 29? Odd. So now we have a word for that, and that makes our discussion a little easier to deal with. So it is to say that squaring preserves parity. If something was even, then its square also will be even. And if something was odd, then its square also will be odd. And as a result, if p squared is even, it must be the case that p was even to begin with. So a consequence of this is we could say, therefore, p is equal to, say, 2. Did, did, I, what if, did, I, did I make a letter last time? I said 2 something, right? Did I not? No, so I'll just say m. p must be 2m for some m in the integers. Now, I'm not saying I, I'm not, it doesn't matter what m actually is. All I'm saying is that because, because p is even, it's got to be 2 times something. Right? 48 is even. It's 2 times 24. 53 is not even because it's not 2 times another integer. So because p is even, it's 2 times m for, for some m. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, and I'm going to substitute it into there. So 2q squared is p squared. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this and put it in there. <coughs> so 2q squared is 2m squared, like so. So squaring, that means repetition. So 2q squared, that means 2m multiplied by 2m Now I can move the 2's to the front and the m's to the back. I move the 2's to the front and combine them, they make a 4. So this would be 2q squared is 4. And then I move the m's to the back, that's m times m, but we write that as m squared. 
Any question about getting here? I'd like to remind you that when we started this argument, I said, this is not something I'm going to test you over. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, please be at ease. OK, now, on this equation, we can simplify it somewhat. What can we do? Divide by 2. Which is to say, we could say, OK, 2q squared divided by 2 is equal to 4 m squared divided by 2. If we do that, the new left-hand side is q squared. And what's the new right-hand side? 2m squared. <coughs> OK. So now, I hope you're getting just a little bit of deja vu. Weren't we at a position just like this, like three minutes ago? We were right there. Right? We said that as a result of being here, it must be the case that p squared is even as a result of being here. What can we say as a result of being here? Therefore, q squared is even, right? Because it's 2 times something. So q squared is even. But we already established that squaring preserves evenness. So what, must, what else must be true? Q is even. But if Q is even, it's 2 times something. Q is 2n for some n in the integers. I claim that this, is, this cannot be. This simply just cannot be. Why, why can this not possibly be true? It's, it's not that n is m. We have q is 2n, and we have p is 2m. So they're not necessarily equal to each other. But nevertheless, I claim that something just is just not right. Let's look at the second part of our assumption. What does that mean? Can't be simplified any further. Can't be simplified any further. I claim that we've shown otherwise. Why have we shown otherwise? Q is equal to P. We haven't shown that Q is P. We've shown that P has a factor of 2. And we've shown that Q has a factor of 2, which means that we should be able to simplify it, right? But we started off by saying it's already simplified. As a result of our assumption that it's already simplified, we've established that it is not. This is a contradiction. This couldn't possibly be the case. So this is a contradiction. to this assumption. Which means that that assumption is not a valid assumption to make. And therefore, it is not the case that the square root of 2 is rational. It is not. So this is a pretty standard style of math argument. You say, I want to prove something. I want to prove something to be the case. I want to prove that the square root of 2 is not in the rationals. So I'm going to assume that it is. Assume the opposite. And then look at this ridiculous consequence of assuming that it's not. Well, that must not be a valid assumption to make. OK. So if you like this style of argument, you like sort of tracing it out and doing this mind-bending stuff, you might consider taking some further math courses. If you don't like this style of argument, 
flee. <laughs> don't, don't, don't take many math courses because this is what all juniors and senior seniors in math have to do. This is, this is considered enjoyable. <laughs> Any questions about it? Okay, good. Um, the next thing. The order of operations. Now I know that most of you, when I say order of operations, a phrase, an acronym comes into your mind. What is it? PEMDAS. And you were taught that in, in grade school. And now I'm going to tell you that it's not right. It's not. Okay, it's really not. And now I'm going to show you what the true order of operations is. And I'm going to explain to you why it worked in grade school, but why it will not work <coughs> in this class. Okay, so then PEMDAS is not the order of operations. It's not. This is the real order of operations. P comes first, just like in grade school. So that's good. Then E. So, so far, so good, right? Now, so far, it's just like grade school. Okay. <clears throat> then 3, M and D, they're on the same level. So this is different than grade school. And then four, A and S are on the same level. Which is to say, if you're performing an a sequence of ar arithmetic operations and you have M's and D's, in grade school you do all the M's first and then all the D's first. All the multiplies first, then all the divides first. That's what you do in grade school. But that's actually not correct. When you have, when all that you have are M's and D's, then the way that you do this is if you have just M's and D's or just A's and S's, you break ties left to right. So let me explain what I mean. So I'm going to two, do two examples. If you're trying to make your page look just like mine, I'm going to do an example on the left and then on the right, if you're trying to make it look just like mine. So for example, 420 divide by 10 multiply by 3. So I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it incorrectly first. So if you're going to copy what I'm going to write, be sure and denote that I'm doing it incorrectly. Okay. So this is wrong. So 420 divide by 10 multiplied by 3. So this is a, what is this one? That's a divide, and this one a multiply. And in the grade school reckoning, you must perform the multiply first. In the grade school reckoning, PEMDOS. So <coughs> that would give you 420 divided by 30. And now there's just one operation, the divide. So you perform that division, and you get the zeros cancel 10, 4, 14. And this is wrong. This is not correct. Not correct. Why is it not correct? Well, I agree you're supposed to divide first, but how do you know you're supposed to divide first? because it's furthest to the left, right? 
All that we have are D's and M's. All that we have are D's, are D's and M's. So what are you supposed to do? You do the one that's furthest to the left. That's what you do. So this is, this is right. 420 divide by 10 multiply by 3 this is still an M or sorry this is still a D and this is still an M but this one comes first because of the rule you break ties left to right So 42 divided by 10, that's, or sorry, 420 divided by 10, that's 42. And then multiply by 3. And now there's just one operation, so that's the one you're supposed to do. It's 126. I'd like for you to note that the answers are not the same. They're different. And so now you might be looking at this and be a little bit suspect and say, well, I remember mrs harris in seventh grade and i trust her she never lied to me <laughs> and she told me pemdos or whatever so you might might say okay well let's have a let's have a fair arbiter here how about the calculator okay 420 divide by 10 multiply by 3 126 okay so does everyone see? Okay. Now, this is all over things like <clears throat> Facebook. <laughs> so, you know, if you've spent any time in social media, you've seen a picture of some sequence of map operations, and then people are raising up their hands in disgust or whatever about them. Okay. The, this is the subject of lots and lots of them, is that the order of operations is simply not known among the American populace. They think it's PEMDAS because you've been told it's PEMDAS. It isn't. It's P-E-M-D-A-S with, with MDs tie, with ties broken left to right and AS ties broken left to right. That's the order of operations. Okay, now the reason why it worked in grade school is actually quite simple. In grade school, they always give you, when they give you operations like this, they just make sure all of the M's are to the, right of, are to the left of the D's. That's what they're doing in grade school. I wish that they wouldn't do it, because it causes no end of, of grief for me by the time uh, people get here. Even, even, <laughs> even it happens, I found math majors, juniors and seniors in math, who still, who still didn't quite get it figured out. And I have to explain to them, no, it's, this is it. OK, good. So any question about this? OK, next example. Something like this. Okay, so here is a, an arithmetic expression. And what we're going to do on this arithmetic expression is we're going to perform exactly one arithmetic operation per line. Now, I know, I know full well that more than one arithmetic operation can occur in one step. But we're going to do exactly one per line. And you have a homework assignment that's just like this, <coughs> one per line. So it's going to take like this many steps to do it. Okay, now, you might say, oh, wow, I really don't want to do that. OK, I really don't want to grade it. <laughs> Terrific. But the point is this, is that each one of you is just one out of 100 students in college algebra. Just one. And I am fully aware that there is a very high probability that you know how to do the order of operations. I'm fully aware that that's almost surely the case. But there's a few students who do not know how to do the order of operations. They don't know it. I need to find them now. And I need to get them into my office so we can get that matter straight. So that's why I'm asking this question. So just do it. It's going to be just this one time, and then you can and then you can do it the quick way with calculator and everything else. But but this one time, 
I need you to do it in its full glory. Okay? So, what must occur first? Good. Uh, the other thing is that um, there is no sig significance in me using different shapes of parentheses. There's no arithmetical si significance. The only reason is that I make these ones both square so that you can very quickly visually see, ah, that one goes with that one. And this one round goes with that other round one. And so when I'm in class, I'll call these round parentheses and square parentheses because I'm pretty sure you know what I mean. But these actually have names, right? The round ones are called parentheses. What are the square ones called? Brackets. And other shapes of parentheses have other names. But I'm just going to call them round and square parentheses <laughs> and curly parentheses and things like that. Okay. So what has to occur first? Innermost parentheses, right? Among all of these operations, you can see, ah, I got some parentheses there, so that means that we're going to ignore that, because it doesn't matter. All those have to occur after the parentheses. And then within those parentheses, oh, I've got yet more parentheses, so those have to occur first. So does everybody see the general rule that whatever's in the inside most parentheses, that's what has to occur first? Okay. Now what? Right. So now, starting again from scratch. Okay, scanning. Oh, I see parentheses. Whatever's in the parentheses has to occur first. So I can ignore that. So I'm ignoring it. And so now I have two operations that are in competition for each other. Which two? Right, exponentiation. 8 to 3, and also subtraction. So this, in the, in the acronym here, what is this one? Number 2, right? This is an E. And what's this one? And, right, number 4, it's an S. So what comes first, E's or S's? E's. So is it clear that it's the exponentiation that must occur first? Okay. So 512 minus 12, multiply by 9, subtract 31. Now what? The parentheses, right? So it's the parentheses that must occur. 500, and then multiply by 9, and then subtract 31. <coughs> so now those square parentheses are, are meaningless. They are a null operation, because there's not, no arithmetic operations inside. So now we have two operations in competition. Which two? They're letters. M and S. M and S, right? We have a multiply, we have a subtract. Which occurs first? The M, right, the multiply. So then 5 times 9 is 45, and then two zeros, and then minus 31. And now there's just one operation. That must be the one. OK, so then that would be uh, 4, 4, 6, 9. Any question about this? Is this boring? It sure is. Do you have to do it? You sure do. OK, one time. OK, yes? No. I do that kind of thing for visual continuity so that you it, it, it's really helpful to give, when you're trying to explain something to someone, to leave visual cues about what happened. Other questions? OK. And then it'll be up to me to try and diagnose, oh, someone you know, did something out of order. So I call them in and <laughs> come see me. <laughs> OK. Uh, the next thing. Uh, remark about the properties of 
of the reals. Okay, so I'll say let A, B, and C be in reals. It sounded like our elevator just got here. <laughs> That's what it sounded like to me. Okay, so suppose we have three real numbers. Then first, <coughs> it is the case that A plus B is B plus A. That is to say, for example, that 3 plus 5 is the same as 5 plus 3. It doesn't matter what order you put them in. Okay? So um, this property of the reals has a name. What's its name? Starts with C. Ends with a mutative. The commutative property. Got it. Okay. Commutative. The commutative property. Now, this word is not just chosen at random. The word commute means to move around. That's what it means. So it's called the commutative property because notice the A's and the B's moved around. They switch sides of the, of the addition. Commutative. Good. Two. A plus B in parentheses and then plus C is the same as A plus in parentheses B plus C. So now, left to right, the ABCs are in the same order on the left hand side and the right hand side. But what's different? Right, which ones are in parentheses. <laughs> so according to the left-hand side, this is saying that A plus B has to occur first, because that's the order of operations. Whereas this is saying that B plus C has to occur first, because that's the order of operations. What this property is telling you is that, in fact, it does not matter. You can choose either one. You can choose the one you like. What is the name of this property? It starts with A. Associative. Now again, this word is not chosen at random. Associate means to make a group. Here, we've got that group, grouped it like that. Here, we grouped it like that. We're saying that you can group it however you want. The associative property. Okay. How about this one? A product B is B product A. That's a B. Okay. What's this called? Commutative. Commutative. But now we need to, now I hope you see that there's a need to distinguish. <coughs> Commutative. So it's the commutative property for product. So I'll, I'll denote it like this. We're going to call that one the commutative property for product, and this one the commutative property for sum. So sum is commutative, product is commutative. Which is to say, for example, 3 times 5 is 15. How about 5 times 3? Also 15. Right. Same deal. OK, how about 4? In parentheses, A product B and then product C is A product in parentheses B product C. How about this one? Associative. <coughs> But now you can see that it's necessary to distinguish between these. So this is the associative property of product, and this first one is the associative property of sum. 
So, so far we've got these two operations, product and sum, and they are each commutative and associative. But what happens when you mix them? What happens if you start to try to use them at the same time? Maybe, maybe that's just off limits. You can't do that. No. Right, you can do it in the following way. A product in parentheses B plus C. So what I'd like for you to observe is that what I'm saying is that now we're trying to do an expression that contains both of them. <coughs> and, the, and, and then we have to say what happens when you mix them up. We've got some products, we've got some sums. So it's like this. Uh, A <coughs> product B plus A product C. Which is to say, it's sort of, you know, as a diagram, you might think, oh, okay, the A went with the B, and it also went with the C, right? The B got an A, and the C got an A. Terrific. So what is the name of this? Distributed. Distributed. So the word distributive, again, is not chosen at random. So to distribute means to hand out, to, to, to give. You get one, you get one, right, like that. So the B got an A, the C got an A. A was distributed. So for those of you who just really like to know all the language and the lingo and all of that, I was always that way, uh, this is the distributive property of product over, over, sum. So that's how product distributes over sum. Okay, the reason why mathematicians say that is because you can have other operations. You can say the way, you know, the way product distributes over sum, the way apples distribute over bananas, or wh what, what have you. Okay. So another one. Uh, six. Identity. So, uh, this. So, there is a number, zero, and it has the property that A plus zero is what? A. <coughs> so, adding zero is the same as doing nothing. So, I said it, I said it out loud. What is, it, what is zero called? The identity. Identity. Okay. Next. We have that uh, negative A. In the first place, if A is a number, then negative A is also a number in the first place. And furthermore, if you take a and you add to it negative a, what do you get? You get zero. a plus negative a is zero. And notably, <coughs> that is the identity. So this is called inverse. So I can say, okay, what is the additive inverse of 7? Negative 7. What is the additive inverse of 10? Negative 10. What is the additive inverse of negative 8? Negative negative 8, which is 8, right? But what I want you to see is that the answer is always <coughs> negative whatever I just said. Right? W what is the additive inverse of 13? Negative 13. What's the additive inverse of negative 4? Negative negative 4, which is 4. Okay? So the formula for additive inverse is negation. You negate whatever it is. What's the additive inverse of 0? Negative 0, right? which, is, which is 0. 
Okay. How about how about this? Eight. There is a number one, and it has the property that a product one, a multiplied by one, is what? A. So multiplying by one is the same as doing nothing. So what are we going to call that? <coughs> what do we call it up here? The identity. So we're going to call this one the identity. But I hope that you see that now there's a, it's necessary to disambiguate the two, to be specific. So this first one, zero, is called the, the identity of sum, or the additive identity, if you like. Okay, and what's this one going to be called then? Yeah, the identity of product, or the multiplicative identity. Okay. So then, <coughs> now we have 1 over a. 1 over a has the property that a product 1 over a is equal to what? 1. And notably, what is 1? The identity of product. So, what are we going to call 1 over a? Inverse. But now I hope that you see that it's necessary to distinguish among these. So, we call this inverse, we call that inverse, so now what are we going to call this one? The inverse of sum. Or, if you like, the additive inverse. And what are we going to call this one? The inverse of product, the multiplicative inverse. Okay. So, this, a to negative a, that's negation, right? Negation. Whereas this one, a to 1 over a, what's that called when you take a and make 1 over a? Fishing for an r word. Starts with r, ends with what? There it is, reciprocal. <coughs> so the formula for multiplicative inverse is reciprocal. So for example, what is the multiplicative inverse of 5? 1 over 5. What is the multiplicative inverse of 3 over 2? 2 over 3. What is the multiplicative inverse of negative 2. 1 over negative 2, right? So in general, you can just say 1 over whatever I just said, right? The multiplicative <laughs> inverse of 7 is 1 over 7. The multiplicative inverse of banana is 1 over banana, right? It's just, it just keeps going, whatever, whatever. So now, here's a separate question. Does every number, does every number have a multiplicative inverse? Probably not, right? So, so no. Why not? Every number would have to be rational. No, because for example, the multiplicative inverse of square root two, which is not rational, is one over square root two. Does every number have a multiplicative inverse? Oh, it's like zero. But that's just zero. Zero will do it, though, right? Zero doesn't have a multiplicative inverse, because one over zero is not a number. There is no number that you can multiply by zero so that you will get one, which is the multiplicative identity. There is no number that will do that for you. So the caveat on this one is for a not zero. Okay, you can't do this. So does every, does every number 
have an additive identity. Additive. <coughs> yeah, they all do. Every number has an additive identity. Not every number has a multiplicative identity. So we're going through this very carefully because we have these two operations that we're playing around with. We've got add and multiply, sum and product. And as the semester progresses, we're going to add, add, we're going to accumulate another operation. And it's going to have its own identity and its own inverses. Okay, and, and it will be just like this. So instead of having, you know, one for product and sum, one for product and sum, one for product and sum, blah, 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 we're going to have even another one, even another operation. Okay? But that's just going to have to be a foresh a just foreshadowing. It's coming. Any question about this? Okay. <coughs> Last thing for today. Last topic. <coughs> Please substitute, <coughs> substitute x equal to 7 into 5x squared minus uh, 6x plus 12. So can someone in plain language uh, tell me what it is that I'm asking of you? Replacing x with 7. Right. I want you to take this expression that's got some x's in it, and everywhere you see x's, I want you to replace them with 7's. That's what I'm requesting of you. Okay. So 5x squared uh, minus 6x plus 12. Now I'm going to write something so that it's clear, but I'm just going to do it this one time to make sure that you understand the convention. So now, I've got two symbols here. I've got a 6 and an x, and they're written <laughs> side by side. What does it mean when they're written side by side? It means product. That's what it means. Okay, so then this expression is the same thing as me writing 5 product x squared minus 6 product x plus 12. So when you write things side by side, it means product, if you don't write the, the dot in between them. That's what it means. OK. Um, now, everywhere I see an x, I want to replace with a 7. OK, so that would be 5 times 7 squared minus 6 times 7 plus 12. Any question about how I did that? So now let's perform some arithmetic operations, and we're not under the constraint to do just one at a time. <coughs> so let's do multiple at a time. So I can see that, OK, 7 times 7 is 49, so that's 5 times 49. And then minus 6 times 7, that's 42, and then plus 12. So I was able to do 2 at the same time. Now 5 times 49, that's 245. <coughs> minus 42 plus 12. And then I guess I'll perform that subtraction. So that's, what, 203 <coughs> and then plus 12. So 215. Any question about getting there? OK, so now one comment I'd like to make is that, in case you haven't picked up on what I'm doing. When I write in English, I write it in capital print letters, like this, this blocky style. And then w that's when I'm writing English phrases. When I'm writing math phrases, I write in this cursive style. And it's not because I'm losing my mind, it's I'm doing that on purpose. Okay? I'm doing that so that you can tell, oh, that's, that's not math, that's English. And that's, that's not English, that's math. Now, last one for today. Substitute x is 5y plus h into <coughs> 3x minus 10. Okay. <clears throat> 
So since we're coming up on the end, I'm just going to go ahead and, and do it. But I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to make a mistake, and I want you to observe and tell me what mistake is it that I make. So I've got 3x minus 10, and I know that that really means product, 3 product x. Okay, so I'll substitute in the x and get 3 product 5y plus h minus 10. This is incorrect. Okay. Okay, good. So I'd like for you to observe right here. That 3 is multiplying the x. Is it multiplying just part of the x? Like maybe just the top? Or maybe just the right? No, right? It's multiplying the whole thing, right? So that's what the 3 is doing. The 3 is multiplying the x. Now, what is the 3 multiplying down here? Just the 5y. In particular, I'd like for you to observe that the 3 is not multiplying the h. It's not. This 3 is not multiplying that h. Yet. Yet. The h is part of the x. So does everyone see the the problem here. So this is wrong. This is wrong because we need the 3 to be multiplying the h. And the way you fix this is with the following. Instead of substituting like that, you say 3 multiply 5y plus h minus 10. And the way you make it right is you put these parentheses. And now, is that 3 multiplying the h? Yes, for what reason? I'm fishing for a d word. The distributive property. Yes, it is multiplying. So, this would be, if you, if you were to distribute 15y plus 3h minus 10. So the moral of the story here is that when you are substituting in, when you are substituting in. In this case, what was being substituted in was just a single symbol, just a 7, all by itself. <coughs> but this one, there were multiple symbols being substituted in. Every time you're doing a multiple symbol substitution, you must parenthesize it in order to be correct. And I promise you that I'm going, I, I promise you, I'm going to ask questions where you will be required to substitute, and it will be incorrect if you don't parenthesize it. Have a nice Wednesday.